Hello everyone, in this video we're going to do a little bit of mathematics. So I thought, let me just show you a book really quick and we'll do a quick math problem. This is not going to be a long video, I'm just going to show you the book and we'll just do some random math problem just for fun so you can see and learn some stuff. So this book, by the way, is really cool. It's called Calculus and Analytic Geometry and it was written by Sherman K. Stein. And I think this book is cool because it's not as popular as the other ones. Like, it's not as popular as Stuart Calculus or Larson Calculus, but it's a big, thick book. Let me just give it a whiff here, just because, ah, smells really good. The copyright on this particular one, this is the copyright date is, I'm really curious. Um, yeah, wow, multiple times, McGraw-Hill. This one is from 87. Looks like the first time was in 73. Wow. Super old, right? Super old. Yeah, so this is a great book. As you can see, it's been reprinted several times. So it did survive, you know, the test of time, as they say. Uh, you might say, well, I don't know if it's still in print, but yeah, it came out a long time ago, 1973. So I was just thinking we could do some math from here. I'll just find something simple to do, something we can work through. Um, so you can see the kind of mathematics that this book contains. That one's pretty easy. Let's do something a little bit harder. Here we go. Let's try something like this. So I haven't done this problem yet, but we can figure it out together, and then we can get the answer. So this is an exercise uh, from, from the book. So we have the limit as theta approaches zero of theta cotangent theta. Okay, so we're going to find this limit. Okay, this limit. And this is uh, from the book, again, by uh, Stein. Hey, I'll leave a link in the description to the book uh, in case you want to check it out. Uh, just be warned, I don't know if it's still in print, so there might not be that many copies, uh, but I will leave links to any that I find uh, yeah, in the description. So here we have you know, the limit as theta approaches zero of theta times cotangent. So I'm thinking the first step here is going to be to write cotangent in terms of more familiar trig functions like cosine and sine. So this is equal to the limit as theta approaches zero of theta times, and this is going to be cosine theta over sine theta, right? Because cotangent is cosine over sine. Tangent is the one that's sine over cosine. Now, you notice here you have a theta and a sine theta. So there is something that is really important that is taught, and I believe uh, Stein teaches it in this section, uh, I'm looking for it. Yeah, and he proves it. Yeah, it's this this here. If you have, I'll put it in a box. I'll put it over here. If you have the limit as theta approaches zero of the sine of theta over theta, this is equal to one. Okay, this is equal to one. So this is equal to the number one. And so this is a very, very useful fact. So let's rewrite this so that we can somehow incorporate this fact. So continuing, this is equal to the limit as theta approaches zero. And I'm going to do it in two steps just to make it a little bit easier for you to see. Uh, first, I'm going to write it like this. Theta over sine theta times cosine theta. Okay, so we can do that, right? Because this is really over one. There's no issues there. Now watch this. This is equal to the limit as theta approaches zero. So watch this. I want to get this, so I'm going to write it like this. One over sine theta over theta and times cosine theta. Pretty cool, right? Uh, that's because one divided by this is one times the reciprocal. And what is the reciprocal of this? Well, it's this. And times one, you just get that. So boom. Super simple, right? Not, not super crazy, but let me just show you this. So if you had it over here, let me just show you just in case you didn't get it because it's an important strategy. This is one right, divided by this. So when you divide, you multiply by the reciprocal. So it's one times the reciprocal theta over sine theta. And that's just equal to theta over sine theta, which, which is what we have up here, right? So this is a legit move, um, no funny business or anything. All right, so this is equal to, so now you can just take the limit of each piece, right? That's using what's called like the limit laws. As long as each individual piece exists, there's, you know, limit laws that you can combine that will allow you to do this. So taking the limit as theta approaches zero of one, well, it's just going to be one. This limit down here, boom, we're going to use our super powerful 
mathematical powers, uh, this is going to be 1. And then this is a continuous function, so you can just plug it in, evaluate it, evaluate it at 0. Okay, so we get 1 times the cosine of 0. So 1 times, so what is the cosine of 0? Let's think about that. Let's just backtrack. Why not? So on the unit circle, the unit circle is a circle centered at the origin with radius 1. You study it in trigonometry. So on the unit circle, every ordered pair can be written as cosine theta, comma sine theta. Right? So this is a, the unit circle. The radius is 1. So here, okay, this ordered pair is going to be 1, comma 0. This angle is 0. This angle is pi over 2. Okay, this angle is pi. And this angle is 3 pi over 2. We tend to use, we use radians. Okay, we use radians in calculus. Okay, very, very important. So <clears throat> the cosine of the radian angle 0, so the cosine of 0, is going to be the x-coordinate on the unit circle, so it's just 1. So we get 1 times 1, and so that's equal to 1. And that's the answer, right? So, and this is an even-numbered problem, so I don't think the Stein book has the answers in the back of the book. No, why did I pick an even one? This is living proof that it helps to have all the answers, right? It's better to have all of them. Uh, I, have a, I have a theory that I was thinking of, and, and it's, it's one I've thought of before, but, you know, the reason that a lot of these books don't have uh, even-numbered problems, especially the older books, is back in the day, right, before there was no internet, right? So teachers would have to make up all their own problems. So it, let's just pretend that I was a teacher back in, you know, 1975, and I was using this book to teach a class, uh, and I had to give my students a test. Where am I going to get the test questions from? You know what I mean? So um, it would be beneficial if I could use the even number of problems. And so those could be problems that, um, you know, could be put on the test. And that's also good for the students in some sense, right? Because if you're a motivated student, you can do all the problems and then the test comes and you're ready for the test. Uh, it's a true story. When I took partial differential equations, I, I tried to get help from my teacher and he wouldn't, he purposely wouldn't help me. He literally like pushed me out of his office in a very polite way. He was a really nice guy. Uh, although it was a weird smell coming from his office. In any case, um, he was really nice, but he, 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 he didn't help me. He just gave me some hints. And I realized why, because on the test, it was those same questions that he put on the test. So I struggled and struggled and struggled, and I figured most of them out, and I ended up doing okay on the test. So, yeah. Anyways, rambling. Great book, by the way, uh, Stein. And hopefully you learned a little bit of mathematics in this video, just a, a random, random video. Uh, yeah, I, I like doing math on these little, uh, little things here. If you found any value in this uh, content, feel free to subscribe if you want to. If not, that's okay too. I have courses. They're on my website, mathsorcerer.com. Check them out. They're actually on Udemy, but please use the links from my website because I've lowered the prices and um, you get a low price. So yeah. Until next time, keep doing mathematics.